Um, they were rampaged along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. Fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out firing tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week? Or from bottom with six points and second from bottom with throw? Yes and no. Yes and no. It paid off for them. They got a two, double the four, and one six points. Depends what the teams are budget do, doesn't it? I'm biased. I was dead. Welcome to another episode of Unbiased with Miles Davis, where we go behind the scenes and behind the people and the stories behind the people in the magnificent game of Lawn Bowls. Joining me today, a, a man who's oh, probably known by every sports-loving individual in the in the country, commentator extraordinaire Grant Nisbet. Nisbo, thank you so much uh, for your time. I'm going to, I know this may be a struggle, but I'm going to try and take you back for your dim, uh, dark past. Where on earth did you first pop up on this planet? <laughs> G'day, Miles. Nice to be on the show, mate. Um, look, I'm Wellington born and bred, I'd have to say. Um, and uh, I'm an eastern suburbs boy, so I was brought up uh, on the top of, pretty much on the top of Mount Victoria. Mount Victoria. Went to Hatoto Primary School, went to Rongatai College, um, have spent a bit of time in Australia, four years in Auckland. But the rest of my life has basically been in Wellington and most of it in the eastern suburbs of Wellington. Right, so you mentioned her, her tai tai. I've, I've lived in that magnificent suburb uh, myself. It's a beautiful part of the world. Uh, but primary school, you mentioned her tai tai primary school. What was it like? Can you remember anything at all about going to primary school? Oh, quite a lot, actually. It's funny you should mention it because they're celebrating 100 years as of November this year. And uh, we've been wildly trying to look for people who uh, were roughly in our class because we're very lucky. And 25 years ago, celebrating the 75th, we, uh, a whole group of us decided we'd go to uh, the reunion of the Hatara Primary School. And at the time, the Governor General of New Zealand was Sir Michael Hardy Boys, and he's an old boy of Rongata, of, of uh, Hatara Primary School. And he, he actually offered up Government House on the Friday for us to ha have our first meeting. So it was quite memorable, really. And uh, here we are, 25 years down the track. I think most of us are still around. And so uh, we're scrambling around trying to find um, enough people to, uh, to make it worthwhile. But, yeah, it was, it, was, it was one of those primary schools that you went right through. There was no, there was no uh, intermediate. So you went right through. And then um, it was a bit of a rude awakening. Once you left primary school, you found yourself at secondary school where you suddenly didn't have a Christian name. You were just simply called Nisbet as opposed to Grant. So, um, but, you know, very fond memories, obviously, of, of Hatara School. It was a long walk to school every day. Not like the pampered people today who get dropped off by their mother and picked up. We had to walk <laughs> up and down the hill every day. Yeah, there's not too many places on the flat in Hatai Tai. That, that's, that is that, correct. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, can you remember any teachers at all? that? Because uh, I think back fondly to my primary school days uh, but can you remember any teachers that, that had a, a an influence on you well i can remember the i can remember my first uh, primary school teacher in fact i think if you ask me my first memory in life it was probably day one at primary school when i was five um because it was a rude shock because uh, i never went to kindergarten so my mother dropped me off and i cried the whole day um and miss robinson and uh, I, I guess miss robinson has long passed on but uh she tried to console me through my first day at uh, primary school, but the one that stuck out was was a fellow called uh, Mr. Ferguson, Gavin Ferguson, Gus, we called him, and he was a very good sportsman, and he used to play all the games in the in the uh, playground with us, whether it was touch rugby or cricket or football, whatever, and he was a memorable character, and I've never, ever forgotten him. That's magnificent. I, I, it's always good to have those sort of positive memories. Uh, just suppress the bad ones. We, we don't want to talk about them, Nisbo. You, you said you, met, you, you went from there to, uh, to Rongatai College. Um, it's got a bit of a, uh, how, how should we say, a rough and ready reputation nowadays, uh, Rongatai. What was it like when you went there? Well, yeah, I don't, I don't know quite so much about today. I sort of try and follow the, the sporting teams and all the rest of it. Um, but 
We had a very um, we had a very dictatorial headmaster, a guy called Noel Mackay. Um, and I've got to be honest with you, for a couple of years I was scared of the bloke. Um, we had very high standards, and, and I guess most secondary schools too, in terms of discipline, you had to wear a cap, you had to have your socks up, you couldn't wear hard shoes on the grass, which was a bit of an irony because on Saturday you'd run around in boots and tear it up, but nevertheless, those were the rules. Um, so, uh, but I enjoyed my time. I'd, I'd, I'd love to go back and, and do it all again, to be perfectly honest. I enjoyed my time. I was no great scholar, and I guess I, when I look back now, I probably basically stuck around uh, to play sport and uh, and reasonably successfully, I suspect. I didn't get school cert the first time I missed. I should have got it. It was just that I didn't put enough work in quite clearly. And then ironically, uh, I was given it the next year. I was given school cert. They called it an Agritac pass because I was in hospital because I was playing sport and some clown banged me in the, in the leg and I had to have an operation. And then you wouldn't want to know about it. The year after that, I was actually given UE. So I've never actually sat, successfully <laughs> sat, an examination. That, now, <laughs> I, I'm wondering, were the school that desperate to get rid of you? That they, yeah. that they did it? And, and how, how, tell us a bit more about that injury. I'm fascinated with that. Well, it was uh, it was a hematoma in my calf, actually. I, we were just playing touch rugby and, and things get a bit boisterous from time to time. And I got a knee in, in my calf and got a very bad hematoma, and they were quite concerned that the blood clot that had formed might eventually head to the heart or the brain or whatever, and uh, that would be the end of me. So into, into hospital I went, and in those days, hospital stays were about 10 days. Not like today. If you go in for a knee operation today, they pretty much boot you out the next day. But in those days, you were there for about 10 days, and it just happened to fall right in the, uh, in the school cert period when I was supposed to be sitting my second bout of school cert, so they had to make a decision, um, and they decided that I'd probably done enough in that second year uh, to warrant being given school cert. So that, that's the way it turned out. Oh, that's yeah, can't argue with that. Can't argue with that at all. Although, although one th- does wonder what you put down in your job application if they did any research and found you didn't actually pass them this. But, well, um, that's right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. In, in those days, once you left secondary school, uh, the, the more qualifications you had. The better pay you got, strangely enough, you, I, pretty much I'd imagine in the public service because when I joined the, the NZBC, I think that was a, um, you know, was part of the public service. So I think the fact that I both got both school cert and UE meant that I got another couple of bob a year. Now you, uh, you, you, you at school, you played rugby presumably, um, and you played for the first fifteen at, at Rongatai. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I, I played three years on the first fifteen, and. The, and the final year, I was lucky enough to be uh, the captain, and um, we actually went through the sick, we went through the school games unbeaten. We we got beaten a few times by club teams, but we went through unbeaten. Um, we we were the first ever Rongatai first fifteen to beat St Pat Silverstream at St Pat Silverstream, and it was a good team too because they had Joe Caram and one or two others. So we had a very good year um, in the first fifteen and. I was also lucky enough at the end of that season to be named uh, in a Centurion Colts team that went off to Fiji and we played five games over there. And uh, and Joe Caram was in it was in that team. He was, I think, the only guy that actually kicked on to be an All Black. But um, no, so uh, yeah, I did all right actually at secondary school when it came to rugby. That's oh, it's fascinating that, and and I, I just wondering there because I, I I know that you went from um, when you joined a club. You went to Poniki. Why them and not Auries? Yeah, very good point, actually, because I played for Auries as a kid and they were the closest club to where I lived. But um, it was interesting because I had a visit from a couple of blokes. One was a former All Black called Ralph Coulton and, uh, and another guy called Wayne Nichols, who uh, probably should have been an All Black. Anyway, they banged on my door at home one night, um, probably late in my sort of secondary school life, and they said, we'd like you to come and play for um, Poniki, and uh, and um, we've certainly got uh, a pretty good team, and we just think that you would fit straight into the senior team. You, you, you won't need to have to play any of the lower grades. You'll be straight in. And um, I, I sort of weighed it up, and I guess it's quite flattering as a young bloke when... 
and All Black comes along and says we'd like you to play for our club, and that's that's fundamentally how it happened. Well, I'm, I mean, as a Ponicky fan myself, I, 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 having played for them, I'm glad that you you made that choice. But I, I understand that your career there didn't last overly long. No, look, it was only four seasons, Miles, after, and mainly because of the job factor. Um, you know, it was always going to happen. As uh, as a young sports broadcaster, most of what you do, you did in the weekends, obviously because that's when the sports being played. But I was, I guess, I was lucky enough to play four seasons. Quite often, I'd play a game, I'd jump in the shower, then I'd jump in my car and I'd be off down to the old broadcasting house in Wellington to uh, to read the results on a Saturday night before I actually rejoin my teammates for a few beers, you know. So um, even even when I was playing, um, you know, the job, the, the job doing... I, in fact, I can tell you another good story too. I used to, uh, if I was playing a, a senior rugby game on a Saturday afternoon, I'd work Saturday morning by jumping in what we used to call the radio car and do six sponsored reports. You'd, you'd drive around to somebody's place and it might be the captain of the, uh, you know, the Wellington cricket team or the Wellington, uh, any, any, any uh, sporting personality. You'd drive around to their place. They'd come down and sit in the radio car. You'd do an interview. And, um, and so I did that for a couple of years. And, you know, I'd have to be finished, particularly if you're playing an early match, which usually around about 1.15, you have to be finished by midday pile into the car, roar off and get changed and play the game. And so I, I guess broadcasting was always going to win the day. So I was just lucky that I got four years out of it, really. That, that's fascinating. I, I'm just So why broadcasting? Was that the first thing that you did? Was that the first job that, that you did? And, and what drove you towards that? Yeah, well, it, it, it was. And I joined, I left Brongatai College at the end of 1968, um, whenever that was, probably in November or early December. And I started a broadcasting house in Wellington on the 31st of December, 1968. So I had a break of about three weeks. And, and I've never really been in anything else other than broadcasting. And it all came about, really, because I was mad on sport, absolutely mad on sport. But I had been accepted to go to Otago University and uh, and do their physical education course, which I think was a three-year course. And if you came out of that, you uh, you qualified to uh, to teach phys- physical education. And I guess I would have been back at a secondary school somewhere. But um, I had a neighbour who knew Sir Lance Cross extremely well. And, and uh, you know, I'd, my parents, I, I doubt whether I'd be brave enough to do it, but my, my parents sort of pushed the case a wee bit and said, you know, I wonder if there's a chance of an interview to get a job because Sir Lance Cross at the time was head of the NZBC Sporting Service. He was also a very powerful man. He was on the IOC. He was the head of New Zealand basketball. Um, he was probably the most high-profile administrator in sport that New Zealand had at the time. Anyway, um, somebody made the brave call, gave him, uh, gave him a ring, and he said, yeah, why not? Um, and I ended up being interviewed by some personnel guy at uh, at the NZBC. Next thing you know, I've got the job. So the Otago University thing goes out the window and I'm starting as a cadet at Broadcasting House in Wellington on the last day of 1968. Can you remember how much you were earning? I reckon it was about 1,100... Now, let me think here. Pound or dollars? Uh, when did we do... It'd be, it'd I think be it was dollars, probably dollars. Yeah, I think it'd be yeah, dollars. Yeah, well, I, th- I think we'd gone to decimal currency in 67. So, yeah, I think $1,100 a year. Now, was that... You know, were you excited by that uh, at that age or d- did you think that's a bit measly? Oh, look, any money was good money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I tell you what, $1,100 was a reasonable amount back in 1968. I tell you something, Miles. Uh, on a Friday night, you could put five dollars in your back pocket, and you could go out and have a pretty good night. Um, a jug of beer back then, from memory, was about thirty cents. So, if you wanted to spend a dollar, you can go and get three jugs. So, you can imagine that five dollars probably took you a long way. So, I guess it's all rel- you know, it's all um, relative to the time, but. No, I didn't. I didn't complain at all. Eleven hundred, eleven hundred sounded sounded pretty good to me. How, how did you make the the transition to commentary? Where did, where did you get your first opportunity to do commentary? Well, it's an interesting question because I didn't actually get on air for six months because 
Um, the interesting thing about when I was interviewed was I was never I was never voice tested. They just simply accepted me as a cadet. So I, when I turned up, um, I'd had no voice training or anything else. And so they actually in those days had a system where they where they um, it certainly gave you voice training. And the, in the NZBC, as it was called in those days, they had a voice training school, which was mainly manned by uh, fellows who had come through the old BBC system. So it's a bit embarrassing. But when I listen back now to the early days of uh, my broadcast, I'm rounding the vowels terribly well, you know, and, and sounding very British. And... Um, uh, and that was purely and simply because they finally gave me some voice training. And and so I eventually got on air uh, around about six months after I I joined the place. And, well, the commentary sort of came along a little bit long, a little bit later. I always wanted to do some commentary. And what I used to do, actually, is just take an old uh, recorder and go and sit, if I had the time, I'd go and sit and... I remember sitting down where some Pat's Colleges in Wellington these days used to be a running track down at Evans Bay, and I used to sit on the bank, and, and uh, there'd be guys having races, and I'd just be commentating to myself, and I'd take it back to Broadcasting House, get some people to have a listen to it and say, what do you think? Keith Quinn was one of those guys, actually, and what do you think? Where can I improve? And I'd also do that sometimes at Athletic Park, go and sit miles away from anyone else because I'd be too embarrassed if they heard me. Then take it back and say, what do you think? And so that's where it all started. And um, I guess my first real break came, I think it was around about 74, when Brian Russ, who was the commentator at Athletic Park, the rugby commentator, he went off and did an all-black tour to Australia. And he said to me, um, you're going to have to fill in while I'm on way. And, and uh, he left me a few notes. And uh, that was it. And it was, a, it was a terrifying experience. It really was, because it was an open an open plan box at Athletic Park, so people sitting in the grandstand could hear everything. And also, you were the ground announcer, so you had to push a button uh, during your own commentary and, and uh, name the replacements and all sorts of things. So it was a baptism of fire, to be perfectly honest. So uh, so when you're doing that and you're announcing the replacements of that, do, does that get broadcast as well? So you, you, you're going to two channels then, the radio yeah. one and the ground one. Yeah, that's right. Well, the old the old two YA it used to be on, and so uh, you just have to say, well, I'm I'm now going to have to make the announcements. And and uh, Brian used to handle it brilliantly. And uh, but I I was a bit of a nervous uh, I was a bit nervous in the early days. But nevertheless, we got by, um, and that's where it started. Really, when did you progress from from domestic games to to international? Well, that came a little bit later. In 1975, I think it was the then Labor government decided that radio and television should become separate. And I actually stayed with radio in those days. But uh, when I just started, well, not that I did very much of it, um, we also used to run a few TV shows. And I think it was called Sports View on a Monday night. Um, and uh, I might have my, my, I might have done the odd guest appearance or the odd voiceover. I, I honestly can't remember. But I guess the big break came um, in 1985, I think it was. Uh, Keith Quinn, you see, had, in '75 when the big uh, when the big um, cut came, he decided to go with TV, and off he went. And of course, uh, did a lot of commentary, TV commentary work. But around about '84, they decided that he. Um, should do administrative work and they they didn't want him for whatever reason to do commentary and so they were looking around for somebody else and I got the call, did a bit of an audition and um, and decided that yeah, I'd give it a crack. So I went from um, Radio New Zealand as it was then uh, to TVNZ at Avalon and that was, no in fact it was 84 wasn't it? So yeah, look, I'd, I've done I've done sort of 16 years mainly in radio, uh, with a wee bit of TV thrown in. But by '84, I'd uh, decided I'd give TV a bit of a crack. And, and basically, you haven't haven't looked back. Um, c- can you remember anything? I, I believe it was a France All Black game was your first um, all, you know, all Black test that you commentated on. Uh, I think that was 84. Can you remember anything about it? Well, I mean, I'm assuming you'd be exceedingly nervous. Yeah, look, I, I don't remember much, to be honest. I mean, if I went back and I had a look at the game, I think it was a game where 
I think it was a game where the French tried to drop kick goals from all over the place. They might have succeeded with a few. Pretty sure the All Blacks. Um, pretty sure the All Blacks won that game. Um, I've, I've, I've got to know Sir John Kewen, obviously very well working with him at uh, Sky, and he said that was his first test, and he said he played an absolute shocker, and um, you know he, he could have been out uh, after one test. So, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm slightly more vivid in my memory of the Aussie tour that followed, uh, which was the first of three tours to Australia. I remember, I think the first test I did over there was at the uh, the famed Sydney Cricket Ground where they used to play all the rugby tests in those days. And uh, so my memory of that is somewhat more vivid than, than the very first game, which was the old Lancaster Park in Christchurch. Magnificent place uh, as well, and it's funny you, you mentioned Sir John Kerwin. Just as a little aside, there I was at uh, Athletic Park when he scored his first try against England oh, in, right, in eh? 1985. So there we go, Nismo. We're sort of like oh, we're converging there because I, I came here in '84. So yeah, well, so, I, I suspect that might have been against uh, England, was it? It was against England, yes, and um, it was closer, 13-9 at half time, and then we got thrashed. So let's move on. <laughs> for, let's move on from there. When, when did you do your first? You're doing rugby, but when do you start? You've done multiple sports. When did you first do your um, TV debut on a sport other than rugby? Ooh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'd done a fair bit of cricket and radio before I actually went to television, so I'm thinking that probably it's uh, Test cricket. And I did a lot of test matches. Actually, I never went back and I never went back and sort of counted the numbers uh, over the years. But I'm I'm thinking that I probably got into test cricket just about as quickly as I got into uh, test rugby. Because of course, in in those days back in the 80s, there was a rugby season and a cricket season. Nowadays, uh, there's not really much of uh, you know anything because the rugby season can start in February and finish in December. Uh, once upon a time, there was a clear sort of line between the two. So I'm thinking I probably did uh, test cricket, quite a lot of test cricket, um, uh, as early as the mid-80s. When you look back uh, over it, I mean, and it's, it's a tough question to, to answer. Can you think of a, a couple of um, events that, that really stick in your mind? Uh, and then maybe for different reasons, you know, whether it be rugby, cricket, athletics, you know, really memorable um, events that you commentated on. Yeah, well, uh, probably the most, probably the most memorable, and I didn't do anything. I sat there and watched. Um, I was supposed to help out Ian Woodley at the 1976 Olympics in Montreal. I was, they said, they said to me, uh, Ian's going to do the commentary of the gold medal match between New Zealand and Australia. Would you go along and do comments? And I thought, look, I know nothing about this game. But anyway, I didn't say no at the time. I, I just said to uh, Wooders when we got there, I said, mate, I think you can probably handle this. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not really going to be of much assistance, so I might just sit here and enjoy it. What do you think? He said, yeah, you go for it. So I went along and, uh, and, and s- simply watched the game. Uh, but it was great to be there to see New Zealand win a gold medal quite clearly. So... Um, I can hardly say that I made a major contribution to that, but nevertheless, I was there, which was uh, very pleasing. But um, look, I've been I've been lucky enough to be at a few uh, amazing places. I remember being at Lancaster Park. This was back in radio days when uh, there was a major controversy between the West Indies and New Zealand, and the West Indies got very annoyed at our umpire, who uh, was Fred Goodall at the time, and he was, they felt, making poor decisions, and they refused to come out of the dressing room after tea. And uh, it was a real standoff. And uh, eventually they did re-emerge, but there was some really bad blood, unfortunately, in, in that game. So that was that was memorable. Um, I think um, uh, Fred's, Fred's, uh, Fred's still going strong somewhere in in Lower Hutt. I think somewhere around. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. The yep. Hutt yep. Valley. He was he was a he was a military man, old Fred, <laughs> and he kind of conducted himself as a military man when he was an umpire as well. He was very rigid and very formal and all the rest of it. 
Uh, but I can tell you something, Miles, the West Indies didn't like him. I know. Colin Croft gave him the old shoulder charge, yep. didn't he? <laughs> he gave him the shoulder, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, having looked at the uh, having looked at, at footage of that particular test, uh, I think the West Indies may have had some grounds for, for yeah, grievance. Yeah, uh, the interesting thing was, I've heard Colin Croft interviewed several times, and he, he has, in inverted commas, no memory of that happening. Yeah, fair enough too. <laughs> what, what about what about moments there in, in commentary that... Um, was sort of heartbreaking. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, what I've learned to do over the years is try and distance myself uh, from the emotional side of it. And I know people sitting at home can get very emotional, and I've done it myself. But I think if you're going to be true to commentary, you've really just got to try and um, I would always say sit on the fence, I guess. I mean, uh, I've been in some pretty heartbreaking uh, situations, um, although you won't appreciate this because you'd sit on the other side of the fence here. I've been at Twickenham three times when the All Blacks have lost. Now, that is heartbreaking. And uh, <laughs> I was at the 1995 World Cup, admittedly not on air, uh, because uh, Keith Quinn did the commentary, when we lost that heartbreaking uh, World Cup final. Um and I've been, you know, I was there when we didn't qualify in 91. So, look, there's, there's, there's always a lot of lows in this sort of game, but probably overtaken by the highs, I reckon. Right. On the, on the, um, more on the, the bowls side of things now, when did you first get involved in the game of bowls? Where did you first have a crack at it? Well, um, I mentioned Sir Lance Cross before. Now, he was a member of the Seatoon Bowling Club, which was quite close to where I was living at the time. And uh, he said to me once, he said, have you ever thought about having a game of bowls? And I, and I said, no, I haven't really. Um, I played a bit of golf and, and this sort of thing. And uh, he said, well, I tell you what, if you're interested, there's a gala day on, on Sunday uh, on a particular Sunday, and if you like to sort of come round in your civvies because it's a gala day and you don't have to dress up, um, if you pop round about sort of nine o'clock, I think the gala gets underway at nine thirty. So I thought, oh well, I will. I'll give it a crack, and I went round. Well, I couldn't believe it because in those days, um, you know, the Sea Tomb Bowling Club, I think there was a waiting list almost. So I get there on a Sunday morning about nine o'clock, and they're standing at the bar about ten deep, and I thought. Am I coming to a bowling club or am I coming to some sort of social occasion? But um, so that's where it all started. I, I, I had I went to the gala day. I really enjoyed what I was doing and pretty much took it from there. And I've been bowling. I was going to say full time, but that wouldn't be right because I've always had problems with the weekends, obviously. But so, um, but you know, this was the late eighties, so that's fundamentally where it started. Now I know, where you're th- and, and you're famed for your lack of backlift as well. We, I'll just put that out there for, for everyone, which we, we found out a couple of years ago. I, I, yeah, well, I've never, I've never seen myself bowl. I just have to rely on other people to tell me this. Now, you, uh, Seaton, are you, you're obviously still a member of the, of the club there, or uh, and what sort of? Um, I saw somewhere you were vice president at one stage. Is that right? Yeah, still, I'm still the vice president. <laughs> I said to, I said to uh, our president, I said I'm happy to be the vice president, but I never want to be, I never want to uh, to go to the next level. Thanks, I'm quite happy where I am. Um, look, things have changed a lot over the years, and and the same can be said for a lot of bowling clubs. I think uh, we put down an artificial about uh, 30 years ago, I suppose, that annoyed a few people, so they left. Um, and so getting members is is a real issue these days. So you've got to look at other ways of utilising the bowling club. So it's it's still a bowling club, but it is uh, it's a community facility, and it's um, it's a thriving actually uh, community facility, which sits right in the middle of Seatoon, which is uh, quite an uh, as you would know, having spent a lot of time in Wellington, Miles is is an interesting suburb because it, it, you've got to go through the tunnel to get there, and and it's uh, you know it's it's kind of unique. It's a suburb on its own, really. So, um, look, it's, uh, as I say, the, the, the actual bowling has uh, probably diminished more than we'd like, but it's still a thriving club. Is, it, is there still the licensing trust there? Because there used to be issues, didn't there? You couldn't buy a pint in C2, I seem to remember. Yeah, well, that was, that was the whole eastern suburbs, to be perfectly honest. I think the first pub in uh, the eastern suburbs might have been, 
might have been around, um, you know, heading towards Oriental Bay. There was no, there simply were no pubs until they had a general election and a, and a kind of a referendum. I think they are, uh, oh, about, oh, it must be 30 years ago, surely, now. Um, and and it went from being a dry area to uh, to a licensed area. So, you know, there's, there's, um, things have certainly changed in the last 25, 30 years. Right, a, a little bit on your personal life. And, and um, I, I know you've got two daughters. Um, you, you lost your wife, I think, about six years ago, Nisbo. You know, that must have been quite tough to deal with. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's a shocker, and you know, you you, you obviously you, you just have to move on, really. Um, and yeah, that I mean, that life throws some horrible curveballs, doesn't it? And we and we've all got stories like them, um, whether they're exactly the same or somewhat different. So uh, you simply have to move on, and um, and 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 we do. Um, but you know, over over the time that. Uh, Tony was around. She was hugely supportive of, of the job I do, which actually involves being away from home a lot, uh, quite clearly, if you're on tour or just travelling around New Zealand and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, she had she had mostly to do with the with the with the girls growing up, um, but they're well and truly grown up. They're in the 30s. I'm even a grandfather, believe it or not, Miles. Oh, congratulations on that one! Now, now, now your two daughters. What are they doing now? Well, the eldest is um, Brooke. She lives in Auckland. She's the one who had the twins. Uh, she, uh, oh, they've been up there for quite some time. Although my youngest decided that she was never going to get on the on the property ladder by staying in Auckland, and so she made the brave decision to go to Christchurch and actually got herself on the property ladder, which is uh, which is great. So uh, she's she kind of works in in the sales area. Uh, Brooke, obviously, with twins, is a full time mother. So. No, I'm very proud of them, actually. Very proud of them. I, I'm not surprised. Do you get to see them often? I suppose, you know, if you're up here for, for test matches and various things in Auckland, then, then you can get to see them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm, 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 still, I'm still their dad, so um, I have to make the effort, generally speaking, <laughs> <laughs> to, to do that. But that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's a real incentive, obviously, to go up uh, and, and see the twins as well. And um, and uh, Kirsty down in Christchurch. Uh, so yeah, I do. I get I get to see them as as much as possible. Now, in, in um, your bowling, uh, you've had a little bit of, of success in in recent times. You know, relative success at the nationals. Uh, with, yeah, <laughs> with your old mate John Macbeth. Tell us about that. Yeah, look, it is it is relative, and um, you know, I mean, we we never go into these things with any great expectations, actually. Funnily enough, John and I played together as far back in the Nationals as 1991. Now, we've both only been playing a couple of years. And I decided I wanted to play in the Nationals in Wellington. And as I said, I've been playing a couple of years. And I thought, well, I'm going to play everything. So I played in the singles. And I, I looked around and, and uh, to find someone who might like to play in the pairs with me. And, and John played. And we had, we had a lot of good, we had a lot of uh, fun, actually. Uh, I don't think we won much. And then I played in the pair, in the fours, at least. And... So that was the last time I played in the Nationals until about uh, three or four years ago when a group of us, and uh, and John was included again, decided, why don't we go down and play in the Nationals in Dunedin? And um, and so we did. And again, because it was a fair old trip, we decided we'd do everything. So played in the singles. My first game was against Rob Ashton, and I got a hiding. John's first game was against Shannon McElroy, believe it or not. And um, they knew each other pretty well, and and John actually got ten shots off him, so he was re- he was wrecked. Um, and then we joined up in the pairs, and we had a bit of fun. And then we joined up again in the fours. And from memory, we qualified in the fours. Um, can't remember the details, so we we were we were pretty pleased about that. So a couple of years later, we went to Tauranga and played in the nationals again. This was only the fours this time, and we did qualify. And we got knocked out uh, in, the, I think, the round of 16 by Morris Symes, who had actually beaten us in section play by one shot, and then in um, in the uh, post section beat us by one shot again. So when you say success, 
Um, it's not like we're sort of uh, winning trophies or anything, but we're having a lot of fun and winning a few matches. I'll tell you what, I, I, to get within one shot twice of Morris Symes is a pretty decent achievement in the game, oh, of, in the game of lawn bowls. He's, uh, he's a very well-known name and a top player for many, many years. Finally, Nisbo, in your sort of professional career, in your, in your, in your commentary, what are you looking for? Is there anything that, that you'd love to do, you know, that you think that... I'd love to be able to commentate on that event. Something that perhaps you haven't done, or something that you've done that you wouldn't mind doing again. Oh, look, there's a fair, there's a fair old bucket list. Um, I think I've pretty much, uh, you know, I've done a few World Cup finals in rugby, and um, I was lucky enough to cover the 1996 uh, World Cup of cricket in India and Pakistan with my old mate Smithy and Sir Richard Hadley. So. Um, uh, but in terms of sports outside of the obvious, um, I'd love to one day go to Yankee Stadium. I'm a mad Yankees fan, and I don't know why. Um, so I'd like to go there and maybe not commentate, maybe just sit there and enjoy it, to be perfectly honest. I've done an Olympic Games. Um, I've done Commonwealth Games. There aren't too many things. Um, but I'm, I'm fundamentally a sports fan, really. Um you throw any sport, and I'll sit and watch it. I, I have, I don't have any hatred of sports. I know, I know a lot of people go, oh, I can't stand that league, or I can't stand this. I, I just sit there and enjoy sport for what it is fundamentally, uh, Miles. But I, I guess if there's one thing I'd like to do, because I did go to New York a few years ago, but sadly it wasn't in the baseball season, and I went to the old Yankee Stadium, thinking I might be able to have a little sightseeing around, but they, the sightseeing had finished for the day. So the best I could do was wander around the car park, which is hardly satisfactory. <laughs> so I think I think uh, possibly uh, to Yankee Stadium when the Yanks are playing the Red Sox. That'll do me. That that sounds like a, a fantastic event to, to be at. I, I might come along with you, Nisbo. Yeah, I might come absolutely. along with you, mate. I, I, I'm a Cubs fan, though, so uh, maybe when they play the Cubs. Oh, I'll tell you something about the Cubs just before you go. Yep. When the All Blacks when the All Blacks played in Chicago a few years ago, uh, we happened to be there when the Cubs won their first World Series in over a hundred years. And I tell you something, it was unreal. And then two days later, when they had the parade down, I think it's called Michigan Avenue in Chicago, it was unreal. They had uh, well over a million people in one street. It was just phenomenal. So. I was a Cubs fan too for about a week. Yeah, I'll tell you something. I think it's something like 108 years. There was there was a T-shirt going around Nisbo where they said any team can have a bad century, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I enjoyed. I'm totally envious of that. Grant Nisbo, thank you so much for your uh, for your time uh, on t- joining us on Bi- on Unbiased today, and uh, hopefully we'll hear your dulcet tones on the airwaves for many years to come. Good on you, Miles. Enjoyed it. And they were rampaging along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. A fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out fine tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week or? In the bottom with six points and second for bottom with throw. Yes and no. Yes and no. It paid off for them. They got a two, double the four, and won six points. Depends what the teams are bugging you, doesn't it? I'm Bikes, I'll stay with you.